Thanks, Robin. Really appreciate it. Hello, everyone. My name's John, um, member of the developer relations team at Progress. Um, I'd like to thank you for coming out to this talk. The title of this talk is A Deep Dive into Kenda UI. Uh, Kenda UI is my company's commercial UI component library for web developers. And it allows you to basically uh, build a, a ton of different types of web apps using our large set of components. And since this is Components Conf, I thought this would be the ideal place to talk a little bit about that. You really could name this talk, so you want to, so you want to be a component developer. The reason why is because um, I've been part of the KenDUI team for a long time, actually since the very beginning. And I have a few stories to share. And so my hope is that uh, seeing how this is Components Conf, it would be uh, useful to share some of those stories with some budding or current component developers such as yourselves. And uh, we've made some mistakes during our development, I'll, I'll be completely honest, but I think we've made a lot of really good decisions as well. So for those who aren't aware, Progress provides uh, a bunch of solutions for folks like ISVs, enterprise customers, and developers. Uh, the company that I was a part of, Telerik, uh, was acquired in 2014. And since then, we've acquired also Kenve, if some of you might be aware, or Ipswich. Uh, just to give you some stats, we have over 1,700 ISVs who use our software, uh, over 100,000 enterprise customers, and about 2 million developers who use our UI controls. Uh, for those who aren't aware, OpenEdge, one of our flagship products. We've also, uh, obviously, Telerik itself. Maybe you are some of our customers. That'd be great. Um, we build both .NET and JavaScript solutions for developers. So if you're using a UI control uh, based on one of those two, chances are we got a solution for you. Maybe some of you have heard of NativeScript. Anyone? So it allows you to build good. Allows you to build mobile native mobile apps using JavaScript. Um, so that's us as well. We also have a Sitefinity called Sitefinity, or sorry, a CMS called Sitefinity. And uh, I could go on, but that's not the focus of this talk. And besides, you don't want to hear me go on endlessly, so I'll just move on. So uh, bottom line up front. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to share some stories that underscore these eight tips. Uh, these aren't in order, as you'll see, but I want to, to provide this list for context. So do your homework, support, don't boil the ocean, go where they go, do what they do, automate everything, don't break stuff, and docs, or it didn't happen. So to begin, uh, I'd like to start with just setting the stage for telling you a little bit about KenDUI itself. This is to ensure that Everyone is aware, and some of you may not have heard it. That's totally fine. So Ken UI is our commercial UI component library for web developers. Uh, with these components, you can build out a number of different types of web apps, regardless of your JavaScript framework. Uh, Ken UI out of the box is a, a compre comprehensive set of UI controls that supports jQuery, Angular, React, and Vue. And these components, uh, with the exception of one, are 100% native. So they're built from the ground up targeting each library or framework independently. And the only exception, as I mentioned, is Vue, which at the moment is a wrapper, uh, a set of wrappers around our jQuery components. However, these will be entirely native uh, very, very soon. It also provides uh, a set of server-side integrations for ASP.NET MVC, ASP.NET Core, PHP, and, and JSP. And this is done because we have a lot of customers who have asked for them. And so when you're building out a component library as a developer, it, it can help developers a lot by providing these sorts of integrations. And we still use Kenda UI in the front end. It's just that we provide these nice server wrappers in .NET, PHP, and Java so that developers can use it easily. They, um, and they in turn emit the front end code that Kenda UI is actually based on. And so could customers build these solutions without it? Yes, totally. They could just use Kenda UI and away they go. But uh, things, this, things like this make it far easier for them, and that's the whole point. So I'd like to take a moment and explore Kenda UI through what we have here is a tool called the Process uh, Progress SaaS Theme Builder. This is a tool that can provide an environment for customizing themes that we ship with our components. And just for those who aren't aware, it was built with TypeScript and Angular. So I'm going to go ahead and switch over to show you that. All right, cool. So if you go to do this URL, themebuilder.telerik.com, you can play along at home. Uh, we have a number of products that utilize our themes, but just to show you one example, I'm going to create a theme based off the material design, uh, design language from Google. Uh, we have other ones as well, like Bootstrap, et cetera. 
just to give you a sense of the types of widgets or controls, components that we have inside of these frameworks. So some of the common ones you might be familiar with are ones for navigation, like buttons, toolbars, button grips, et cetera. Uh, we have these ones for selecting various items. Uh, so I can go ahead and type in uh, various characters that autocomplete. Uh, we have combo boxes, et cetera, et cetera. So these are basic controls that oftentimes are very useful in the context of a web application. We have other ones as well, like a grid component. Uh, this is great for sorting, filtering, paging. A uh, variety of, of operations are built in there. This can connect to both a local and a remote data source. We have other ones like a tree list control. So this control allows you to get a lot of uh, hierarchical information through a built-in uh, tree list dis display. Anyone working with financial data or wanting to uh, work with um, uh, the calculation of various sums, et cetera, can use our pivot grid. We have a spreadsheet. If you've used Excel, you might be familiar with that. Built-in editors, upload controls, things for layout. We have this control for conversational UI, which allows you to build chatbots, a uh, very nice interface for displaying text to a user, providing options, et cetera. And then as we move down, scheduling, Gantt charts, calendars, et cetera. So the, the bottom line is, is there's a lot of controls uh, available in Telerik or in Kendi UI. Um, if you want to check out the demos themselves, we have a demos page, which is at demos.telerik.com. There you can see the variety of demos we have for our various controls, like those for Angular, jQuery, React, et cetera. And we have a number of examples that you can go ahead and check out there. So that's just a sort of a quick look at can do UI. So I'd like to take a step back and talk a little bit about the motivation for this library. Um, component libraries are built either out of necessity or a market opportunity, or sometimes both. And in the case of Kendi UI, there were a bit of few factors at play at the time when we shipped. And while we're diving into the bit of the, the Kendi UI story, I want to uh, help you understand our decision-making process that went into the library. So um, the hope here is that as you understand what we did, um, it might help you when you're looking at building out a component library or components uh, going forward. So Ken UI was announced to the world back in August 2011, and after months and months of stealth development, we shipped it out um, and made it available as a public beta. At the time, we positioned it as, quote, the combining the best of HTML5, CSS3, and what we called evolving JavaScript APIs to deliver a unified client-side app framework. And the reason why we say evolving JavaScript API is because if you remember back in 2011, some of you are too young to remember, but uh, back in 2011, there was a lot of work that was being done around HTML5, around JavaScript APIs. There was a lot of uh, contention, if you will, between the various browser, browser vendors, uh, prefixes, et cetera, libraries, uh, polyfills, et cetera. There's a lot of stuff moving, on, uh, moving around the space. And so we decided to provide this one framework that would unify all of that and provide it in a way that developers could use easily. We targeted jQuery at the time because it dominated the front-end landscape at the time. And in fact, it still does in many aspects. Of course, this depends on who you trust and who you measure through. Uh, another reason why we targeted jQuery was because it was highly fragmented in terms of the plugin story around it. As many JavaScript developers here know, um, when you were targeting jQuery back in the day, there were a lot of plugins for various things like templates and data binding and localization and validation. And so, and not all of them were compatible either. So it created a, a bit of a, a challenge there from a development perspective. So we decided to address that by providing or building Kendi UI. Our goal was to provide everything you need in this one app package. Shortly after shipping our first release of Kendi UI, I decided to construct a site uh, called jQuery UI versus Kendi UI. Uh, the reason why we did this was because we kept getting a ton of questions about Kendo UI, and so customers wanted to know how it compared to the very popular library at the time, which was jQuery UI. And so we built this site, and you know it allowed you to go through step by step looking at each component library, and to reduce the amount of time for us spending answering questions. Uh, so you can create something like this: you can buy a vanity URL and make your site open source. And so, as a tip to any component developers out there, do your homework know your market, uh, conduct research. And there are a number of sites that you can go to to check out this info. So builtwith.com is one example. These guys are uh, based in Manly, so shout out to them. I'm a big fan. 
The HP Archive is another resource you can check out uh, to gain some insight into the developer landscape. Uh, this was started by Steve Souders back in 2010. And what it does is it crawls the internet for a ton of information and inspects not only the, uh, the contents, but also how it's built based on its performance. One of the great things that they've done is they've published all their data to BigQuery. So that gives you the opportunity to walk up to this data and perform analysis on it. And a lot of, uh, a lot of discussion has been revolved around this. So if you're a component developer looking at trying to gain these interesting data points, this is one resource you can go and check out. So for example, using this data, some folks recently have learned that of the top 100 sites that are on the internet, third-party scripts account for more than half of the JavaScript execution time. So that may be significant. If you're a component developer and you're looking at this, will this information better inform your decision making when designing components? Can we do a better solution for this, et cetera? Another example of a data point might be the state of JavaScript survey. Of course, because this is a survey, you have to take it with a grain of salt. However, it does contain some valuable insights for you as a component developer. So if I'm looking at what front-end frameworks developers are using, I may want to target one of those. Stack, uh, Stack Overflow Developer Survey is another good resource to check out. There's jQuery again at the top. Should be mentioned that we do a lot of this research ourselves, and we publish numerous white papers on JavaScript. Uh, this is the state of JavaScript in 2019 and beyond, where we talk about a whole bunch of things and where we think things are going. And sometimes you'll discover information elsewhere. So uh, back in October 2012, when we were doing research into this, uh, PBK conducted a survey back then. And you'll, you'll find a, a bunch of insights in here that this information is quite valuable if you're a component developer. So for example, at the time, 41% of all respondents could not have done uh, their work without a library in their previous project. So that's insightful. So again, tip. Do your homework before embarking down the journey as a, as a developer of components. Stay current. Know what's going on out there. And I think it's important to, to mention that no matter what kind of component library you're building, um, you need, if you need to build something internally, you need to understand your market in terms of the research and uh, understand where framework support is today and also where it's going. So we, we're very much cognizant of that. Jumping back to the history and the motivation around Ken UI. Um, in 2013, there was a lot of momentum around Knockout, you may remember. And um, at the same time, however, we were also watching this thing called AngularJS, and we were discussing internally a lot of the options that were available to us. And we found that the popularity around AngularJS at the time was absolutely astounding. And so one of the things we did was just prior to this, we had announced this incubator project called KenUI Labs. And this was where we could put a bunch of con uh, community contributions as well as integration with third-party libraries. And it was here that we decided to place our bindings for a bunch of different frameworks and libraries like AngularJS, Knockout, Backbone, and others. And so if you're a component developer looking for uh, a possible way of offshooting some work, this is one way you can do it. You can create a labs project. You can contribute, obviously, through open source. There's lots of ways to do that. On June uh, 24, 2013, we announced the Angular uh, bindings for Ken UI. These were a set of directives that we provided for all the widgets we had, and we shipped this under Apache 2. So another tip, don't boil the ocean. Um, so some of you may have seen the movie Contact, where um, Ellie's uh, character is really anxious to make all these insightful discoveries around the aliens that have contacted Earth, and her father keeps telling her, small moves, Ellie, small moves. It's the same idea. You get really, when you're a component developer, you want to build everything that everyone's asking for. And my recommendation to you is that um, don't try and do everything that's, that's out there. I know it's, in, it's encouraging that you're, you know, if you're excited to build these things, but oftentimes it's, it's too much. So creating a, a labs incubator is great, um, and creating community projects is great, uh, but take a piecemeal approach, step by step, and your customers will be happy for it. It should be noted that later on, after we had provided those bindings, they were integrated into the product in 2014. So we actually took that work that we had done and then integrated into the product going forward in 2014. Um, mid to late 2015 was a very significant time for us. And the reason why was because at the time, we were watching the market, and we were trying to decide what to do about this situation. So if you remember, Angular 2 was taking forever to ship. And React at that time was looking really, really good. And the engineering team was making great project. At that time, we had React uh, .14, and the dev tools were coming along for it as well. Um, but it was a tough situation, because we had many discussions about this. A lot of email threads, um, lots of passionate discussions. And around this time, we had a small team looking into the current code base for Kenda UI. 
Um, how would this work with Angular 2? How would this work with React? Um, ultimately, we decided on a few prototypes, and we did some spikes. And we even had an internal project where we attempted to build a complete platform agnostic component library that would work with Angular 2, jQuery, and React. And that didn't really work out for us. We found that it wasn't going to work. And so we ultimately decided that the best approach was to create two different product suites, uh, one for Angular and one for React. And so fast forward to 2017, uh, we added view support and shipped our 100% native controls for React. And now in 2019, we're working harder than ever. Uh, we've uh, added new widgets to all the Kendi UI libraries. Uh, we've just recently added jQuery 3.4 support, Angular 8 support. Uh, Vue 3 is obviously looking very interesting. It's coming down the pipe, so we'll keep an eye on that. And something else that we're pretty excited about is this thing we have called Ignite UI, uh, UX, uh, which we've dubbed from sketch to code in zero wasted cycles. I can't say more about this, but you can sign up on our wait list. It's at progress.com slash ignite dash UX. So our, pri our company prides itself in having a very good story when it comes to supporting customers. And I just wanted to show you a few of the things that we do. If you're a component developer and you're looking at supporting these things, this is um, obviously what works for us. We provide forums for customers. Uh, we have discussions with engineers. Customers can ask general questions or um, ask ones that pertain to individual components. And we provide an account page that centralizes everything for customers. So here, customers can see their support tickets, their downloads, update information for their billing, et cetera. To install software, we provide a control panel. Um, so you can individually install software components if you wish. We also provide a separate download page for every component library that we build. And so this is the download page for Kendi UI for jQuery. Customers can access the latest public, beta, and internal versions of the product. And on the rare occasion that a customer encounters a showstopper, it's useful to provide these internal builds to unblock them. So this is something that we do across every version of the components we ship. And so as a component developer, uh, it's important to provide access to and support older versions of your components. I know it's not the easiest thing to do, but it is something that you should try and do your best job of doing. Um, this is especially, for, especially important for customers who can't integrate or uh, leverage the latest version. Um, migrating to the latest version can take time in certain types of organizations, and so you have to, you have to ensure that you support those customers. We also provide installer packages for Visual Studio and our, the NuGet packages as well for customers wanting support for internal development teams. And so this underscores another tip, which is do what they do. Um, if you provide a component library, it's important to understand the various different ways the developers who use that library are going to consume those components. Uh, many of our customers use an ID like Visual Studio, and that's why we built an extension for Visual Studio so that you can create projects quickly using Kendo UI. Others use a text editor like uh, Visual Studio Code, Sublime, or Atom. Uh, these are integration points for those environments as well. And this also underscores why we built the server wrappers for .NET, PHP, and uh, JSP, as I mentioned previously. So at the end of the day, you don't get to dictate what your comp how your components are consumed. Uh, you should always try your best to listen to your customers, their support requests that they send through, and accommodate any ways in which they need you to build out the components. It's also important to note that we also publish the source code. So a lot of customers find having the source code to be extremely beneficial, and this is something worth considering if you're a component developer. Another tool that we built is the Kendi UI custom download tool. Uh, this allows you to pick and choose the various components that you want, um, and also the versions of those controls. Um, and then once you've done selecting the components you want, we provide a custom JavaScript file that you can download and integrate into your web application. We also have individual and versions scripts for each of the components available on our CDN. So if you want to use that as a fallback, you can do so. All of our packages are published to NPM. And this goes for our Angular components, our React components, and of course, our Vue components as well. Uh, we provide development builds. So again, this is something a lot of customers appreciate. And when it comes to releases, we take the time to articulate everything all the changes that have gone in through the release history pages that we publish. Uh, this is the release history for Kendi UI for jQuery. Kendi UI for jQuery was officially re uh, released on August 4th, 2011. And we've shipped 54 releases since that time. 
So that's 54 different versions of the, lab the library itself. Every lease is detailed and broken down by, uh, on a component-by-component -component basis. So here's the release history page for our Angular components. Uh, this component library was shipped in September 2016. Here's the release page for Kendo React. Uh, we shipped this two years ago in October. And then this is the release page for our Vue components. And this was shipped at the same time as our React components in October 2017. So in addition to the releases that we provide, we also provide roadmaps for each version of Kendo UI. Um, so as a, Ken, as a component developer, it's important that you communicate upcoming changes uh, to your customers. This can be done in a few ways. I'm not saying this is the right way, but um, you can use a custom page like this or other pages like this. This is the feedback portal that we have for soliciting support and feedback requests from customers. So folks can vote on these uh, features and communicate. we can communicate with customers which ones have been selected for the next release. Another option is to use something like milestones in GitHub. Uh, this is another way you can communicate a roadmap to customers. And this is a list of the closed milestones we have for Kendo UI. Um, as a developer using a component library, milestones are a really effective way to track your progress against any bugs or feature requests that come in. And if your component library is hosted on a site like GitHub or GitLab, then um, this is definitely something worth investing in. There's no perfect way to do this, by the way. Um, this is an example of the iteration plan for Visual Studio Code. Just thought I cited as an example. So as progress is made, list items are completed, and you see that progress occurring as you go through it. So just to talk a little bit about some of the product management that we do, um, we have a number of both public and private repos on GitHub and GitLab, which we host internally. Um, issues are open here for discussion. Currently, we have a number of labels for a variety of things like breaking change, bug, uh, enhancement, documentation, et cetera. And so customers can raise issues here, and then we have discussions internally on the engineering team for them. Uh, to date, we've incorporated over 600 public pull requests from customers, and we have internal discussions executed done through Teams. Uh, previously, we used Slack, but uh, Teams provides better integration with Active Directory, so something to look into. Uh, also allows you to incorporate calendars. This is good if you have a very dispersed team geographically. Uh, we have teams uh, located all around the world. And uh, we use internal channels like this to discuss customer feedback, share news, et cetera. We use AHA to uh, manage any uh, strategy, releases, ideas, et cetera, around the product itself. And so here's an example of the features that we implemented for the release that we shipped back in May 2019. Uh, we had about 17 core features that we implemented in this release. For the procedures that we have for building, shipping, and uh, maintaining our docs, we have a number of procedures outlined in our wikis. And in terms of testing um, for Kendo UI for jQuery, we use Mocha for authoring our tests and Chai for assertions. Um, these tests are executed using the Karma test runner. So here's a quick replay of testing being conducted on this machine. Um, our test matrix is quite extensive. We have over 24,000 tests written for Kendo UI for jQuery alone. So that's just one library that we've built. And um, we have these executing all the time in the background through our automated process. So CI uh, continuous integration and test runs are conducted through Jenkins. And so another tip, if you're a component developer, make sure you automate everything. And I don't really mean to go on too much about the reasons why this is a good thing. Um, we have builds running all the time for our continuous integration. So every check-in that we do, we have a build run. Uh, we have a test run, et cetera. So it's really, really something worth doing. So just some other things for Vue. We use Jasmine along with Karma. Um, for uh, Angular and React, we use Jest. Uh, both are set up on a package-by-package -package basis. And each component comes with its own tests. And there are some common tests that we leverage across each library. For end-to-end -end tests, we, um, we must simulate actual user interactions rather than isolated component logic. That's really, really important when, when talking about testing. If tests fail, we typically debug using Chrome DevTools or we'll use Visual Studio Code. Um, these are run within a separate node process. Uh, we do that for performance and stability. Um, Pro uh, Protractor is used for our end-to-end -end test suites. We use Selenium and Nightwatch, obviously, as well for part of that. Um, other things in terms of project management, top-level projects we have in Kendo UI uh, for each library. Support uh, is done through a Lerna mono repo, and uh, we host the components uh, in separate packages within that. So Lerna is a tool that allows you to basically optimize your workflow. 
around managing multi-package um, repositories with GET and NPM. It's great. So another tool, when uh, tip, rather, when implementing your components, it's vital to try and limit your breaking changes. This is a, a core tenant on our engineering team. We try not to break stuff. This is why we write so many tests. So as part of the process of doing check-ins and testing code, that's why everything is automated. That's why we use these tools. So this may sound obvious, but we value stability as much as our customers do. That's really, really important if you're a component developer. And each breaking change will directly impact the work that not only your colleagues do if you're on a team, but also uh, the work that customers have to do to, to resolve the issues that may be introduced. So that's why we try our best to not ship regressions by writing unit tests, by making sure that we conduct code reviews, uh, and probably most importantly for our customers, we don't break the IPI. So um, this should be a last resort if you're building out a component library. Um, they should be, any breaking changes should be proposed and discussed internally, and um, you know, that should be well communicated definitely if you're on a team doing that. So on the design side of things, there's other aspects to this. Obviously, um, we have a d dedicated front end and design team, um, and they share their designs online. Um, this is one tool that obviously some component developers might appreciate. The, the theme builder that I showed you earlier allows you to get a sense of what the look and feel of each component will be. Um, but we also publish the various uh, PSDs or Photoshop files for these components. So this is one showing the grid. Uh, there's another one here showing the chat UI, so it's giving you a sense of any uh, padding, margins, uh, et cetera, that come into play, the various types of states that the component can live in. And this is uh, an example of the, the adaptive uh, capabilities of the scheduler. So this can work on phones, uh, and it, giving that context there allows people to understand, okay, this is the way the component should look when I render it on a smaller device. Here's a little... Uh, I, w I won't show you too much, I know it's small, but the reason for that is because it's a component we haven't shipped yet called the Timeline, this is coming very soon. So uh, look forward to that. So speaking of design, um, there's a lot of ways you can do this. This is a storybook that I created for our React components. So storybook, if you haven't seen, is an open source tool. Allows you to develop UI controls for React, Vue, Angular uh, in an isolated uh, case. So it will generate docs for you, allows you to test them very easily. Um, allows you to have your, your UI structured very efficiently. In fact, let me just show you quickly what that looks like. So you can navigate to uh, Storybook, uh, the Storybook website and see this, but this is the, the one that I built for our controls here. So um, you can see what, a, what, what Storybook actually does. It's structured through a set of what are called add-ins or plugins. And what these allow you to do is basically uh, get a variety of information around what the component's doing. So in this center part here is your component. So in this case, I have a chart control. And then I have a variety of add-ins that I've used here. So I can chart the various actions that have been raised. I can take a look at any accessibility issues that may, uh, may be present with this control. Um, there's an add-in here that I like a lot called knobs. This allows you to basically tweak and turn any various characteristics you have exposed on a particular component. So for example, uh, I can change the various looks and feels of this. So I can say I want to add an icon, for example. It allows you to do that. Um, it allows you to generate a variety of different uh, doc types. You can change the type of user agent it's using. You can change the background and see how your component runs within that background. Um, you can test for accessibility. You can test for you know, grid alignment, et cetera. So there's lots of features built into Storybook. And it's a really great tool I would recommend checking out if you're a component developer. So this is one that I built for our React controls. Um, I showed you the demos uh, earlier. This is a great resource if you're interested in that sort of thing. So providing online demos turns out to be a really useful aspect of being a component developer for consuming them, because it allows you to see how they work. Um, this is the Kendo UI Dojo. This is something that we built uh, back in the day when Kendo UI first shipped. This was predating you know, all those ones that you saw uh, that are available now, like Stack Blitz, et cetera. Um, this, this wasn't even available back in the day. We built this as an interactive learning resource for people to run through tutorials and see how the widgets actually work. Um, we built this back in August 2012. Uh, we built it on Node and Express, and it was built with KendiUI underscore and uh, CodeMirror. So those are the tools that we used to build that. 
This is a tool we have called the Chrome Inspector for Ken UI. Uh, it was inspired by the AngularJS Batarang. Uh, allows you to basically inspect widgets that are present on a page, get information around the various uh, aspects of them. We have a built-in linter for this as well, so you can lint the, the, uh, the static JS and see if there are any configuration problems that may arise, for example. And we've also published a ton of different videos uh, for customers wanting to know more about the library. The whole reason why I mention this is because in addition to building the components themselves and obviously testing them and making sure they're well documented, there's a lot of ancillary things that need to happen in order for you to be successful as a component developer. And this is just one aspect of that. Providing videos where people show sort of walkthroughs or how to use various uh, components in various states, it turns out to be immensely helpful for, for developers. It will help you in terms of reducing the amount of questions you get through your support channels. So it is something I would recommend. Nothing speaks better than a video or a demo. And I've often said that despite the fact that a picture is worth a thousand words, I've often felt that a demo is worth a thousand pictures. So if you have a demo that you can show folks that's live or a video showing the exact use case that's being asked about, um, that turns out to be worth a lot. So definitely worth checking that out. So in addition to all these resources, there's obviously a lot of various other things that you can do, but the point here is I don't, you know, I, I'm not going to prescribe that these are the be all end all, but they certainly have worked well for us. So just again, another tip, don't boil the ocean, as I said. Uh, building these things out are hard, and you want to do everything, and I get it, but you have to take your time. Another tip, uh, docs or didn't happen. Uh, documentation is absolutely vital for being a component developer. Um, we have over 630 knowledge-based articles up on GitHub. And these knowledge-based articles uh, provide detailed answers to technical questions that come in through our various channels. So these are like how-tos based on customer feedback. So they, they provide a, a question, uh, an answer, and a solution. And these are auto-generated auto through Markdown. And so each of these provide an example that you can launch through the Kendi UI Dojo. And so there's lots of things that you can do there. Um, but the whole reason why docs are so vital is just because, obviously, that's the first place developers are going to go when they're utilizing your components. So going forward, make sure you invest in them. There's a lot of different tools you can use. Obviously, authoring them in Markdown turns to be pretty nice. There's JS DOM and other tools that you can use as well to help support your documentation efforts. But um, it is something that you have to get buy-in from your entire team, for sure. So I'm at 35 minutes, and I just wanted to wrap up with the eight final tips. Again, do your homework. Make sure you have support. Don't boil the ocean. Do what they do. Go where they go. Automate everything. Don't break stuff. And docs or it didn't happen. So once again, my name's John. Thanks for having me. Appreciate the time. And thought I'd open up for any questions if anyone has any. Hey, John. Hi. Uh, so obviously some of the companies decided to go with different UI components. Uh, what do you think the migration process, how complex would be the migration process from that UI component to uh, this one actually can do UI? And can we do it component by component? And that's my first question. The okay. second one is, how easy it is to customize the components on your framework? Like okay. I'm not talking about the text or sure. color of the button. I'm talking about specific UI, uh, specific UX uh, requirements like paddings and very complex stuff that we had to do it. We had to override this style in the different UI components. Yeah. Uh, so I'll answer the first one in terms of migration and such. Um, I'll speak in a general sense. I won't target Kendi UI because I want to speak at a higher level in regards to components. Um, there are various ways in which you can write your components so that they work well within the framework that they're running upon. So that's part of the reason why we decided to tackle each library that we support independently and leverage the features on a case-by-case -case basis that they expose um, through those components. And so we started with jQuery, we then evolved into Angular and React, et cetera. And we were discovering things along the way. And obviously, those things are not static either. They're going to evolve over time. In terms of migration, it really is, I, I, I'm afraid to say, it depends, you know, I know that answer is always said, but it really depends on how many, uh, how much integration you've done with the component itself. Obviously, there's un underlying data that supports all of this, so does that data come from, it, it, does it have to be consumed in a certain way to work with your component library, or can you get it, can you get access to that data in a very easy way? That's the first challenge. After that, it's the design challenge 
um, what design resources are available to the component library, how is the component exposed, uh, what sort of, does it, does it support customization as you rightly point out? So not just text, but things like padding margins, color schemes, uh, right to left support, locales, internationalization, like touch support, there's all kinds of different things you have to uh, obviously think about. And so, um, you know, in, in, the in, the, in the case of Ken UI, we, we certainly think about all those things. Um, but in terms of migration, it really depends on what you've done. My, my recommendation for most migration projects is to start simple and small. And write, uh, in, in some cases, that means have a spike where you write the, the uh, I guess, a prototype or a throwaway um, using just the libraries as is and just try and keep the data consistent. And then other cases, you might want to just use one component and then to just drop it into that one location. You can totally do that as well. Um, really depends on how you want to structure it. And I, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't recommend like, blow, you know, nuking everything from orbit and just saying, okay, we're doing everything this way now. It certainly is, is uh, you can certainly use more than one, that's for sure. So your second question um, was regards to customization. And in terms of our controls, I, I don't want to speak too much about it because I've been talking about it for a while, but you should write components that are highly customizable. Um, all our CSS classes are well documented. Um, we, we use prefixes to prevent collisions. We have a, a, the theme builder uh, UI that you saw earlier allows you to customize everything. Um, you should do your best to expose those capabilities. Um, by the way, when you, the thing I didn't show you about that was um, when you customize the widgets, we'll generate for you either the less or SAS file for you. So you can integrate that if you want. Um, but we publish those online as well, so you can totally target those as well. You should, you should try and provide that, uh, that customization if you can. Because the reality is, is everyone's going to make it look different. You're, no one's going to follow the design guidelines of Twitter or Google or whatever religiously. They're going to do a little bit of customization in each case. So um, providing that extensibility or customization turns out to be a really nice thing. Did I answer your question? Uh, yes, one more question, sorry. Okay. So if I bring in one component tomorrow in my framework, uh, does it support the dynamic theme changing that you showed us? Uh, so those, those dynamic theme changes are targeting very specific classes in the styles. So no, but um, yeah. <laughs> so there are tools to, that allow you to do certain things like that. So uh, Storybook would be a good example. So Storybook allows you to take, it provides, as that, that tool I saw, showed you earlier, Storybook, allows you to host, have a host container for your component, and then you can tweak any part of it that you wish, and it just dynamically changes. And you can see all kinds of interesting things run. You can run unit tests, you can generate docs. There's a lot of really good uses out of Storybook, and changing themes would be one of those as well. So changing uh, the various, uh, various properties of various classes you have in there would be a great, great use of that. Any other questions? Well, I think that might be the time. Okay. Thank you very uh, much, you. guys. Really appreciate it. We've got a booth over here. Check us out.